Algae is one of the biggest pain points in the aquarium hobby. And we often think of algae in our aquariums and ponds as the evil villain that must be destroyed. But myself and many other aquarists have a different view of algae. And today I want to show you a different way to think about algae, how it can even be helpful. But there are times when algae gets out of control and causes problems. Today we're going to talk about some of the main reasons why this happens and how we can fix the problem. Two main reasons why we tend to hate algae so much is one, simply because of aesthetics. It often looks unsightly growing on the glass or the substrate or around plants in a pond or an aquarium. And the second reason is because it can take over a tank or pond if the conditions are favorable. But it really, really boils down to control. We want control and dominance over our creation. Many of us are or can be control freaks. And the narrative out there around algae can lead us to believe that if there's any trace of it in your tank or pond, then the whole system is dirty and unhealthy and you are neglectful and you should be ashamed of yourself. But the type of setup you have and method of aquarium keeping can strongly influence our opinion of algae. If you have a carefully crafted, intricate aquascape with layers of manicured plants with distinctive hardscape features, then anything that is not of your doing will stand out like a sore thumb. Now this approach can be satisfying if your ideal of perfection is achieved, but oftentimes one can find oneself fighting against nature instead of working with it. Much the same way that the tiniest weed stands out in a formal landscape design. Another method of aquarium and pond keeping is to emulate a natural ecosystem where we strategically select plants and livestock that fill various niches, encourage the growth of various microorganisms that can help break down waste and even become a food source for fish. In this more natural approach, we're trying to work with natural systems instead of against them. And the balanced growth of algae is tolerated and even encouraged because it serves a purpose. It fills a niche in the system. Algae is part of a healthy ecosystem. So what is the purpose of algae? Well, generally speaking, algae's main purpose is to consume excess nutrients in the water and be a food source for various aquatic organisms. It doesn't need much light to grow, so it can, it can grow where many plants cannot, and an abundance of light can give it explosive growth. Let's go over a few common types of algae that occur in our aquariums and ponds. Now there are many different kinds of algae and the subject is a deep one. Our purpose today is to just get a general overview of it and practical applications for aquariums and ponds. Green thread or filamentous algae. These are the long green stringy network of algae that aren't really anchored to anything but they wrap around everything and they can be easily removed if it becomes a nuisance. I like to use bamboo skewers and spin them around, which winds the algae onto the stick, then I can easily remove it. In large quantities, it can be removed by hand. Green water is when the water itself is green, also referred to as looking like pea soup. There's no visible algae body, the water just looks green. These are actually phytoplankton that have become overpopulated and suspended in the water column. And as they use up the nutrients in the water, they will begin to die off and eventually the water clears up. Next is hair algae. It actually looks like hairs or fuzz growing on rocks, plants, glass, pond liners, etc. And when excessive, it can smother plants when growing on the leaves. It tends to diminish when the light is reduced. Black beard algae form black silky tufts which can attach to any surface and can be difficult to remove and it really only becomes a problem if it's growing on plant leaves, typically malnourished ones, where it can eventually overwhelm and smother the plant. Brown algae, actually not an algae, but diatoms colonizing new tanks, mostly forming a dust-like covering over any surface, and it can be scraped off aquarium glass pretty easily with a plastic card or a scraper or rubbed off of plants 
and it usually forms when there's an abundance of silica like from new sand or even from the water. Green spot algae, also very common in new tanks and it can grow on any surface and is more difficult to scrape off than the brown algae. In a healthy aquatic ecosystem, there will be some algae present. It helps to quickly use up excess nutrients when imbalance occurs and it can be a food source for many fish, crustaceans, other invertebrates. Even if they don't eat the algae directly, they can still feed on the microorganisms that feed on or live on the algae. So algae is a basic part of the food web. In fact, one of the best ways to raise many fish fry is to keep them in green water where they can feed on the phytoplankton and other microorganisms present. Many fish farms utilize this method, whether intentionally or by default, as well as many hobbyists who breed aquarium or pond fish. And freshwater shrimp and snails also graze on various types of algae. So algae in and of itself can be a good thing in a healthy ecosystem. It is vilified though because it can become out of control in our aquariums and ponds, most of which are not set up as balanced ecosystems. And it either looks very unattractive or it can eventually smother plants and fish in worst case scenarios. Most of the conventional algae treatments, the chemicals, algicides, the UV sterilizers, etc., really should be a last resort because the algae is not the problem. It's only the symptom of the problem. And when we address the underlying problems that cause the excessive algae growth, which really comes down to helping our tank or pond become more of a natural ecosystem, then excessive algae becomes an infrequent occurrence instead of a constant battle. So when we have an outbreak of algae in our aquarium or pond, it is most likely caused by an abundance of nutrients or too much light or some combination of the two. And these are the first things we should look at and address when there is an outbreak. First, let's look at nutrients. And by nutrients, I'm talking generally about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium but there are other nutrients present too. Now these come from poop and excretions from fish and snails, shrimp, whatever other creatures are present in the system. From decaying plant matter, plant fertilizer, too many fish or even dead fish or other organisms. Now the second is light. Excessive light, whether from the sun or an aquarium light, can also be the cause of excessive algae. It doesn't need much light to grow, and if there's too much light, the algae growth can be rampant. And sometimes it's one or the other, either the nutrients or the light that is the problem. And once addressed and given time, the algae diminishes. But many times it's some combination of the two that is the problem, and a two-pronged approach is needed. Now, one of the most common times algae is a problem is in a new aquarium or pond setup. When we set up a new tank or pond, we have an unbalanced blend of nutrients and life that will eventually find a balance and become an ecosystem to some extent. With proper planning, plants and bacteria will eventually use up most of the nutrients as they become established, but until then, algae will most likely begin forming to some degree to begin consuming nutrients. Now this process or first phase of a new tank can last anywhere from a few months to up to a year, just depending on the circumstances. It's during this new tank or pond setup phase that excessive algae growth is very likely to happen, perhaps even inevitable. This is the tank trying to find a balance and order with all of the raw ingredients that we've just put together. And it is a phase that it will eventually grow out of with enough time. And knowing this before you even set up can save a lot of grief and knee-jerk reactions. Let's work through some steps to find the underlying problem. We need to figure out, are there too many nutrients? Performing a simple water test is a good first step in this direction. Nitrogen in the form of ammonia and or phosphates will be the most likely culprits and these can be discovered through a simple water test. So if these are excessive, where could they be coming from? Do we have too many fish? Am I feeding them too much? 
Am I over fertilizing the plants? Is there excessive decaying plant matter building up that needs to be cleaned out? Is the potting media or the substrate media leaching nutrients into the water? The next step is to determine whether or not there is too much light. It's much easier to control the light in an aquarium by adjusting the light timer. If you don't have one built into your aquarium light, you can get one that plugs into a standard wall outlet. Six to eight hours is a good starting point for most planted aquariums and is what most of my aquarium lights are set to. The sun, however, can be more difficult to adjust. If you have a pond that's getting full direct sun all day or a lot in the afternoon, you are probably going to have a lot of algae problems. All of my container ponds are placed where they get around three to four hours of direct sunlight, mostly in the morning and into early afternoon, and this works very well for me. Now, as we go through these steps of determining the underlying causes of the algae problem, a big question we need to ask ourselves, and of course, my favorite question is, do I have enough plants? And the answer is always no, there's never enough plants. Plants can help solve both of the problems. They can help take up excess nutrients out of the water and provide shade. There are three main types of plants, different categories, ones that fill different niches in the system. And when they're grown together, can go a long way towards helping prevent algae overgrowth. The first category is marginal or emergent aquatic plants. In a pond, these are plants like pickerel rush, Japanese sweet flag, umbrella sedge, water celery, Louisiana iris, to name just a few. Plants that would typically grow along a shoreline or in shallow water in a planter, and their roots could be in potting media or in the water. In an aquarium, this could be plants like Pothos, peace lily, monstera, spider plant, hemographis, to name just a few tropical house plants that can be grown hydroponically to serve this purpose. And I've grown over 20 different house plants this way successfully over the years and have tons of videos devoted to this topic. Also, many pond plants, like I mentioned earlier, can be grown out of larger aquariums when given enough light. The next category are floating plants like duckweed, frogbit, salvinia, guppy grass, hornwort, some floating on the surface and others just under the surface, under water. They feed primarily from the water column and they can multiply quickly using up excess nutrients and they often require frequent thinning out because they grow so fast and many can grow in aquariums or in ponds. The third category of plants is submerged plants. These are ones rooted in and feeding primarily from the substrate. Plants like Dwarf Sagittaria, Valisneria, Pogostemon, Amazon Sword, Bacopa, Pennywort, to name just a few. Now many of these are still quite versatile and adaptable and can also grow as floaters on the surface, feeding primarily from the water column, or grow as emergents growing from the substrate up beyond the water surface. Coming up next in part two, we're going to talk about some basic algae treatments for those times when we have an outbreak and need to get the algae under control quickly. And we will also go over some frequently asked questions about managing algae in our aquariums and ponds.